House will come to order. Prayer by the chaplain. God of goodness and God of love. You are the giver and sustainer of all that gives life. Give us wisdom as we seek to be a state that cares for those less fortunate, especially those that have been hit by storms and floods and all forms of devastation. Give us compassion to care for all who are hurting today, those who are forgotten or wounded in spirit. Give us courage to act boldly in the face of injustice. We pray that your presence would comfort those who have been afflicted with fire, storm, drought, and today with senseless shooting. Comfort the families in New York who continue to reel after the devastation this morning. Give all leaders your guidance and affirmation as we together to seek to encourage and restore the lives of all who have been devastated. Send us your healing and restoring spirit, O God. Amen. The chaplain for today is Reverend Dan Nordine from Our Savior's Lutheran Church in East Bethel, Minnesota. Members, please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. A copy of the proclamation from the governor has pla been placed on each member's desk. The clerk will take the roll. A quorum is present. And pursuant to Minnesota Statute 2010, Section 30, 
3.073. I declare the House is organized for this special session. Call on Representative Dean offers the following motion. The Chief Clerk will read the motion. Dean, moving, to, moving that the Chief Clerk be and is hereby instructed to inform the Senate and the Governor by message that the House of Representatives is now duly organized pursuant to law for this special session. Call the member from Washington, the majority leader, Representative Dean, to explain your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Members, this is uh, custom and courtesy to notify the Governor and the Senate that we are duly organized and ready for business. Appreciate your support. Discussion to the motion. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of the Dean motion signify by saying aye. Opposed nay. The motion prevails. Introduction first reading of House files. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report these House files and give them their first reading. Introduction and first reading of House File 1 through 3. First reading House File 1 through House File 3. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Dean moves that the rule therein be suspended and urgency be declared that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that House File Number 1 be given its second and third readings and be placed upon its final passage. Member from Washington, Representative Dean, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Members, this, is, uh, this motion will allow us to take up the bills I've spoken with uh, the minority leader who's in agreement that we should do this in order to take up the disaster relief bill. Appreciate your support. Members, if you could, please. Take your conversations to the alcove, or better yet, the retiring room. The member from Hennepin, the minority leader, Representative Thiessen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, agree with the majority leader uh, that we should vote green on this motion. Discussion. The member from Scott, Representative Biskins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, members, um, uh, I have some concerns oh, about the process that has gone forward um, in bringing this bill to the House floor. Members of my caucus know this in emails I've sent out. I'm making this statement here uh, publicly. You know, I've been involved in numerous special sessions in my 14 years here in the legislature, but never once have I been in a special session where every single letter, every single T, every single I has been dotted, and the members of this body have no ability to change it. I think that's wrong, and I think it's a terrible precedence, members. You know, if this was a small bill, we need to come up with the state match to get the FEMA money. I could understand that. But here before reason, us is a bill that spends three times yep, the state biennial yep, budget in absolutely. agriculture. Agriculture for the entire state of Minnesota. No one can doubt that that is a huge business. And we've got a bill that spends three times that. And we have no public hearing. We have no testimony, we have no committee meetings, we have no input from 95% of this body. And we were told, I heard it on the radio this morning, that there can be no changes. The governor said there can be no changes. This morning I asked in the House Ways and Means Committee, can we amend this bill? And the answer, the answer was we can amend it if the four caucus leaders and the governor agree. We have turned this legislator, this representative body from 201 members to five in one fell swoop. Can we allow this to happen? What kind of precedence would we be setting if we allowed this to happen? Members, today is Friday. We can work through the weekend, the committees can meet, and here, now that there's an official bill, we can have public input, we can have testimony, we could do it over the weekend when the taxpayers who are going to be funding this bill can come to the table because they're not at work. We should be having hearings on this bill. We shouldn't say five people get to decide $255 million of taxpayer money and we get no say in that. That's wrong. And it can be fixed right now, Mr. Speaker. I move to adjourn. Representative Biskins moves that the House do now adjourn. 
All those in favor of the Biskin's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. No. The motion does not prevail. Further discussion to the, to the Dean second reading motion. Further discussion. All those in favor of the Dean motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The motion prevails. Clerk will give the bill its second reading. Second reading, House File 2, uh, 1. Second reading. I call the member from Washington, Representative Dean. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 1. Third reading. Discussion. Call the member from Wabasha, Representative Kelly, to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be listed as the author of the uh, disaster relief bill, but I'll be the first to admit that's simply my name on that top of that list. There are so many uh, people involved, in, and Representative Biskins, I'll respectfully disagree with the process. This is a lengthy process. The number of people who've been in, affected and involved in this has uh, been ongoing since June 14th. Historically, what we've done in the past, when we look at, look at the dollars that we're looking at today, $159 million. In 2007, $154 million. 2010, $80 million. So we've done this before, and I'm proud to stand here in front of this body because we get to do what we should be doing from a responsibility standpoint. We should be taking care of those people affected in these floods. I'd like to thank just a, a couple of people right out of the chute here. Uh, Representative Holberg and Senator Roebling had hearings. They asked people to come in numerous times and sat through hours of, of countless testimony. We had department heads who have been working on this for the last three months. And this morning in, in uh, the Ways and Means hearing that we heard, member by member called out Representative Pulowski, and I have to give him credit publicly right now because we actually had a, had a, a, a platform to work off of because of your work in the floods of 2007 and the disaster. So we had a platform to work off of because of your work, Representative Pulowski, and we thank you for that. I think it was Representative Davids who said this morning, there's no way we could have been walking through this proposal in an hour and 45 minutes and have a bill that we can all understand. So thank you for that work. If we start looking at the bill here, like I said, $159 million, we are actually leveraging $200 million of federal money. That's extremely important. That is one of a, the key ingredients here of making this a good bill. We're leveraging dollars from the federal uh, side of things so that we can take care of people right here in Minnesota. You see, Representative front, Kelly, one minute, please. Members, if you could. If you could take your conversations to the alcove, or better yet, the retiring room, Representative Kelly can be heard on the floor. Representative Kelly, you do have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Certainly not here to read the, the bill line by line, but the, uh, the appropriations that we see are on the front page of our, of our bill, totaling the $159 million. The job of this body is to approve this bill so that we can let the people that we put in the positions in our departments uh, take care of this and distribute the money out to the people who have been affected. In my district, in, down in Goodyear County, certainly the personal stories, and we've heard countless personal stories from the Duluth area, these people have been affected. We cannot make them whole. We're not trying to make them whole, but we're trying to do what is right and get them back on the path to being productive and to get their lives back to normal. So we have $159 million in the proceeds to be distributed. But there's a couple other things that we've done in this bill because we've learned from our experience. We've learned from the, from the recent disasters of 2007 and 2010 that we need to have process. If I could direct your, your attention to section 17 of the, uh, of the bill. I believe that's page 20. 
what page is that? Section 17 talks about the Minnesota Investment Fund. The Minnesota Investment Fund is our way of giving back to businesses. And we talk about businesses and jobs all the time over our last session. We need to get the economy back up to speed. This is, this is an uh, area of our state that has been affected the most. The Minnesota Investment Fund are dollars that we can get to these businesses that have been affected. Now, it's important that we make sure that, that we are delivering the funds specifically to those businesses that have been affected. So we put in criteria to say you must apply and you must use these guidelines to make sure that we're delivering the dollars to the appropriate places. One other piece is that we've created a disaster relief fund. This is also another key ingredient, that we take the, the funds that, on these forgivable loans on, for our businesses. If they're in business for a 10-year time period, 50% of, of that fund or of that loan can be forgiven. The 50% that they've paid back will now go into the disaster relief fund. So that comes back to us. And now we're better prepared for the unfortunate situation if, when this happens again. I think that's critical that we're putting in processes. If we move on to Article, thank you, uh, Section 22. I just want to. There's been some confusion, I think, and I actually have uh, heard it on the radio this morning. I think there's some major confusion as to what's in this bill, maybe, and what's not. Uh, the Department of Administration Subdivision 5, and it, and it has a lot of numbers in there, and you might notice this, uh, it might look familiar because it's a lot of the legacy money. So a lot of people grabbed out of that and said, wait a minute, now where is all this money going? We all know now, it might have been a, a little bit since we've been in session, but this is not new language. The only reason that this uh, language is in here is so that we could extend the time period that some of the legacy fund money was given to the Duluth Zoo. We, we know the stories of the Duluth Zoo and how, how much damage they've had. So the reason this language is in here is so that uh, we can simply make sure that the dollars can get there. We re we're extending the time frame. Finally, I'll direct your attention to Article 2, which is not related to, to this incident, but we're talking about another disaster that happened on July 2nd, but it did not qualify for federal aid. And that was the, the blowdown area. And uh, we're looking at uh, the $7.8 million. Now this is not, uh, we cannot leverage the funds from, a, from the federal side, but we uh, are, this is a dollar for dollar appropriations to uh, the areas that have affected there major industry there is the timber industry and logging industry. They need to be made whole so that we can get that economic driver up and running again in uh, northern Minnesota as well. Mr. Speaker, that is the bill. And as I said, I appreciate the time and effort that has gone in uh, and, and the process that has gone in over the time period. And I think it's time that we act as a legislature to get the dollars appropriated so we can get these people uh, back to some uh, similarity of their lives before. And I'd appreciate support of the bill. Thank you. Discussion of the bill, the member from Scott, Representative Biskins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to my colleague from Red Wing, I hate to be argumentative. But I've been you know, here in the legislature for 14 years. I serve on a number of committees. I have a committee chairman here to my left whose committee directly deals with issues here in this bill. I have uh, another senior colleague to my right. There have been no hearings in their committees on the issues in this bill. In fact, members, there hasn't been a bill. I don't know, I've talked to a number of colleagues and they haven't even read the bill. I've read the bill in 28 pages. I've got 18 tabs of questions to ask. Questions which should be asked in the individual committees, but we're not having committee hearings. We've got some select anointed few who have made all these decisions and we are to walk in here like lemmings and rubber stamp it. Thou my friends, you represent 30 
to 50,000 people. How can you do that to the people you represent? It's unconscionable. Mr. Speaker, would the member from Scott, uh, Chair of Transportation yield to a question? <coughs> Representative Beard, I heard tell um, uh, in a news report that the reason we have to, you have the biggest um, uh, single item here in this bill. Representative Beard, how many times have you, has your committee met in the interim to talk about the language in this bill? Representative Beard will yield. The other member from Scott, Representative Biskin, or excuse me, Representative Beard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker uh, and members and Representative Biskin. Um, uh, the there's a short answer, but before I do, I'm going to just, uh, expound just a moment on this process. Members, this is a special session. Representative Biskin, this is a special session. We have, as a body, agreed to suspend the rules to take up a bill. We do indeed have a bill in front of us. As chairman, and this is why elections are important, members, because there's a speaker who appoints members to be chairs, which have certain areas of responsibility. Mine happens to be transportation. The area that I oversee is about 45 percent of this bill, members. Now, I was in Duluth the day it rained on another issue dealing with the port. I was in Duluth a week later, as some of you heard, dealing with the disaster that was there and seeing the mess. Uh, I think maybe you've seen my YouTube videos of flying in the patrol helicopter and seeing uh, just how bad this was. I have a standing relationship with MnDOT as a committee chair, and I trust the work that they've done in this portion of the bill. As a chairman, Mr. Representative Biskins, I had a lot of input into what was going on here. And any member who called me, and there were several, asking me what I thought about the bill, I uh, got my honest and uh, uh, best guess at what was going on, my best opinion. Also, some of the suggestions I made resulted in some of the funds actually being reduced from the original command uh, request. So, Mr. Speaker and members and Representative Biskins, as a chair of this committee, I have had input. I'm very comfortable with the bill. Uh, admittedly, a disaster happens. Things change. We're not in session. This is a special session. And, Mr. Speaker, I have had no committee meetings, but I have had ample input into how this bill went together. Member from Scott, Representative Biscuits. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and, and Chair Beard. And, and I'm not um, um, doubting at all your integrity. You know that. You and I are good friends, all right? Um, but, but the point is that 45% of this bill and the committee has not had a say. Now, every single member of that committee and we know this every, I know we're at the end of um, the, you know, the decade, and so they've gone askew a little bit, but have nearly the same, somewhere between 30 and 50,000 people they represent. We all have an equal voice. We all have one vote. The chair doesn't get 11 votes, and the members each get one. They all have one vote. Then, and so it's important that um, you know, we, as individual legislators, have debate and dialogue and a deliberative process rather than call us in here one day and say now vote on a bill that has uh, you know uh, the ink is isn't wet all right but it hasn't dried for long all right and 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 that that that's disturbing to me representative beard if you'll yield to one more question he will yield representative biskins thank you mr speaker uh, representative are the media accounts accurate that if we don't allocate this money, MnDOT will then have to reprioritize the money it has to fix, to fix the roads? In other words, rather than spend more on top, they would reprioritize the money they have? Or would the roads just sit there crumbled and, and crumbling even more until the regular, um, until regular session? Member from Scott, Representative Beard. Mr. Speaker, members, Representative Biskins, if we did not pass this bill today, MnDOT would follow their mission statement, which this legislature, in its wisdom over the years, has ratified. Safety is number one. That's job one. Transportation mobility is right behind that. If we did not pass this today, they could allocate their resources to put up barricades around the potholes, the mudslides, and the washouts that exist in northeastern Minnesota to protect the traveling public. They could do that and expend those funds without coming here for specific authority because that is in line with their mission. Safety is job one. Now, how they deal with the rest of the budget, 
well, there's going to be a new legislature and paneled here in January. They could deal with it then, but there would have to be um, all kinds of shifts in the budgets going forward. And I think the answer to the question that we're really looking for here today is, we have had an opportunity, we have it right here, right now, as this agency has brought forth a proposal on how they can expend funds and we can authorize funds so that they can accomplish job one without messing with the 20-year and the five-year and the two-year transportation improvement plan members and Representative Biskins and keep everything on track and still protect the traveling public and repair the damage that Mother Nature uh, wreaked on, on, on uh, St. Louis County. Member from Scott, Representative Biskins. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Beard. Um, uh, then I guess the media account was correct. The reason we pass this now is because it might take money out of legislators' um, projects that are, are in the 5, the 10, the 20-year plan. Um, so the reprioritization issue, the media did get that right. I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, members... I'm not going to go through all 17 tabs or how many I have here on this bill, but I'm going to point out a couple of things, just for you to think about. Things that would have gotten caught by some very bright people in this room had we have had the chance for the deliberative process. Representative Biskins, one minute please. Members, if you could. Take your conversations to the alcove, or better yet, the retiring room. Representative Biskins, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, there's some, some inconsistency in verbiage here early on in the bill that was caught in Ways and Means. One section of the bill says everything in this section pertains um, to the disaster relief zone, but then in the section, some sections say, and this part pertains to the disaster relief zone, but other sections don't say that. Uh, lawyer's field day when you've got words like that and you're going to see it come down on this bill we pass. Members, I want to tell you the most hilarious part of this bill when you have time to read it after you vote and you'll find out what's in it. On page 13, line 21, we tell individuals and businesses that it is an ineligible activity to use the funds for any activity deemed illegal by federal, state, local governments or ordinances. Now we tell that to individuals and businesses. You can't use this money for illegal activities. I don't know, is there some guy in Duluth waiting for this money to build a meth lab? For goodness sakes. But the most hilarious part of this is we tell that to the private sector Yet we have no such caveat when it comes to the agencies and the government that get this money. We are so distrustful of the individual and the private citizen that one, we do not create the hearing process for them to come down and chime in on this, and two, we even put in special double secret um, ironclad rules saying they can't use the money for illegal stuff. Unbelievable. And we're going to vote on this. We're going to vote on this. We don't have to today. Let's take it back. Let's look at the issues. Let's look at the pieces. Let's, let's look at the Minnesota Historical Society's quarter of a million dollars and and the chairman of the Historical Society said, well, we need that money because, well, for instance, we might have to fix the Duluth Armory, which is a historical building. Okay, but you know what? His agency was the third agency to say they might need money to fix the Duluth Armory. Representative Biscuits, members, if you could please take your conversations to the alcove or better yet, the retiring room. Representative Biskins, you have the floor. So now we've got a bill that has three agencies setting aside money to fix a building that may not even need fixing. And the sad part is, it's not our money. We hear words like compassion, sympathy, empathy. My friends, it's compassion 
when you take out your own wallet and give of your own blood, sweat, tears, and resources. I'm sorry, but it's not compassion when we take it out of other people's wallets. There might be good reasons to do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a disaster relief bill. But we need to scrutinize what's in this bill. We need to take a little bit of time. Three days. Three days. How long has it been since the flood happened? Three days. Let's vote this bill down. Let's take the shell to committees, have the hearings, have each of us fulfill our constitutional duty to represent the people who voted for us, rather than abdicate that duty to five men and five men alone. That's wrong. This process is wrong. We can fix it. Let's vote this bill down. Let's have hearings over the weekend. Come back Monday with an even better bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from St. Louis, Representative Huntley. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker and members, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Representative Kelly and uh, Representative Holberg, who uh, led this effort, and uh, as well as the leadership of both the DFL side and the House side, uh, and with the governor, I think this was a very non-political process. I think the result is a uh, very good bill, and I would congratulate uh, everybody uh, that was involved with that. Uh, I want to talk about uh, two points, uh, and one relates to the geography of Duluth. Uh, some of you may know I live up close to uh, the UMD campus and my house had absolutely no damage. Nothing. One block down from my house, virtually the same altitude, was complete devastation. And that was, uh, some of you may have seen on the internet the fellow in his kayak that took a picture as he paddled down uh, Woodland Avenue, uh, one block from my house, uh, with a car in front of him that was almost completely underwater. And so Tom Huntley's house was fine. One block away was devastation. That's the Duluth geography. Uh, the last thing I want to say is talk a little bit about the public employees uh, uh, over this entire area. And remember, uh, this was not just Duluth. Uh, this was not just Carleton County. It goes all the way to Aiken. There was floods, uh, severe floods in Aiken, which is uh, 100 miles from Duluth. Uh, south of Duluth, about 50 miles to Moose Lake was severely damaged. North of Duluth, about another 50 miles to Floodwood uh, was severe damage. So this was a huge part of the state. And what I want to talk about is the public employees. Uh, and I'm not here to push uh, unions or anything else, but they were so well prepared. Uh, their disaster preparation was unbelievable, and they worked so well together. Uh, and it didn't make any difference if you were City of Duluth or if you were St. Louis County or if you were Carleton County. Uh, if somebody had trouble with their house or needed to get out, needed to be evacuated, uh, everybody helped. Didn't make any difference which county they were from, which city they were from, whether they were police, road workers, uh, public safety people. Uh, they all did a phenomenal job. Nobody died. You look at the total amount of damage and nobody died. And part of that was due to the public employees that went to work in the middle of the night and worked 12, uh, excuse me, worked 24 hours straight. I can tell you in the city of Duluth, within three or four days, all the roads that had been destroyed were made passable. That does not mean they were fixed. <laughs> and they're still pretty rough and covered with gravel. But in two or three days, people could drive to their house and get in their house. And that was done uh, by local contractors, by city workers uh, in the city of Duluth, and the cooperation and effort 
by these people and their preparation. They were so well prepared. Uh, was unbelievable. So I, I would like to thank them for the excellent job they did and uh, in um, making sure nobody died and in making sure the damage was as little as possible. So thank you uh, to the leadership that has worked this bill through in a very uh, nonpartisan manner. I, I wish to thank you, Speaker Zellers. The member from St. Louis, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. People in northeastern Minnesota have been working so hard this summer. If they didn't have damage to their homes and businesses, they knew someone that did. And they're reaching out and they're working together. People of all ages and all generations have found a way to work together. Minnesotans and people from Wisconsin and South and North Dakota and Iowa and wherever Minnesotans have relatives in other states. We're reaching out with their prayers and with their questions of what can we do or how can we help. And although it was very difficult for the people in our counties, in our cities, in our businesses, in our neighborhood, for the people that were affected to say, you could do this or you can do that. They formulated lists and answered the question and welcomed the people from across the way into their basements with their gloves. And that was one of the most poignant days with their gloves. <clears throat> About 25 to 30 people from Duluth, Georgia came to Duluth, Minnesota with boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of gloves that their neighborhoods had contributed for the workers in Duluth. We met in a park that had been completely underwater, Irving Park and Field, out in West Duluth, on a beautiful, beautiful, glorious morning. And the people from Georgia conveyed to us their boxes of gloves so that people that are volunteering to work on trails and bridges and whatever kind of work in basements and households and garages and gardens that have to be done, they could answer the call. Western Lake Superior Sanitary District worked. Willard Munger would be so proud had he been there to see the value that Western Lake Superior Sanitary District over all these years that he gave birth to worked and has a plan for removal of debris and recycling and all those things that all the people, whether they had great damage or little bit of damage, they, were, they responded and the people had places to bring stuff. We know Wadena, large group of people from Wadena came to Carleton County last month and talked about how they did their long-range plan. And two years later, 
they're only meeting every other week now instead of every week. And they're looking forward to monthly meetings because their address to us was it takes so long but you can do it working together. To all of you today you dropped everything to come and help us. Keep us in mind. Keep the people of northeastern Minnesota in mind. They know you're here. They're counting on us. We are trusting the agencies. We are trusting the federal government and FEMA and the Small Business Authority to keep on working with us. But today, most of all, we ask for your vote yes and we say thank you. Thank you so very much. And keep us in your thoughts and keep us in your prayers. Thank you. The member from Crow Wing, Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too uh, rise to thank the body for working together in a bipartisan way for those of us that have had constituents, businesses, infrastructure uh, that had been devastated by the flood. I appreciate Representative Kelly, your efforts, and Representative Holberg, your efforts, along with the leadership efforts of all the House, member, House leadership and Governor Dayton as well. Um, Representative Huntley uh, indicated that it's not just, and Representative Murphy also, that this wasn't just in the Duluth area, but kind of in a northern Minnesota, central Minnesota area that was devastated. Um, I will tell you that in Crow Wing County, the area that I represent, we have uh, significant, significant loss in that area as well. Some of our small businesses and some of our infrastructure um, was, was uh, torn apart and also some individual constituents. Shortly after the flood, I visited an 86 and an 84-year-old World War II veteran, 86-year-old World War II veteran uh, and his 84-year-old wife, who were living in their house, completely filled the basement with water. They were living in their house, doors open so that they could get some air in there, no power, no hot water, a little bit of running water, they were trying to dike, we were trying to dike the house, we were diking the house so that the, the, we could keep some water out, trying to get a sump pump in there to pump the water out. And this 86 year old World War II veteran, Representative Kelly and his wife, we tried to get them into a, into a safe living condition and they refused it because, you know, they're proud people, all of us in Minnesota. And so they stayed in their house and they stayed in their house uh, as it was, uh, you know, um, in, in getting infested with mold and mosquitoes and things as such to fight the good fight. And so today you are providing hope and help for people like that, that couple. I also visited a, a handicapped uh, gentleman whose basin had been cracked and broken apart uh, by the flood, by the water coming into his basement at such a rate that it broke up his concrete in his basement. Even this past week, I received an email from a couple over in the Crosby Aiken area who have continued to have water in their basement. He's a uh, educator in the Crosby School District who has uh, who has uh, had a leg removed. He's an he has a, he's an amputee, and so he could not do a lot. And so what we are providing here today, my friends, my colleagues, is a lot of help and a lot of hope for those people whose lives have been turned upside down, who are living in terrible conditions, as Representative Murphy indicated, whose lives will never be the same, but we are providing some hope for them as well. So 
also on a side note, you know, most of you know that I'm from Proctor and I just spent some time up in Proctor and represent Huntley, represent Murphy. I know that Highway 2 coming out of Proctor going down to Duluth was totally wiped away. Totally wiped away. So the residents of Proctor are also now uh, having to go on a different route, an alternative route, uh, down, down to and back from Duluth. And we don't know when that's going to be taken care of. The people, you know, that uh, visit Highway 2, that are expecting to travel on Highway 2, uh, coming up through Proctor, uh, Representative Paymar, you're familiar with that area as well, you know, have been, uh, you know, have, uh, have to take alternative routes. And um, we're just thankful that there is not a lot of lives lost in that, in this whole devastation. And so, on behalf of the constituents of my district and my fellow, my friends uh, back in Proctor and also back in Proctor, I would urge for a yes vote today and appreciate the leadership and the, all the folks that worked on this bill uh, so that we can provide again help and hope uh, for the citizens of the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the chief author yield for a question? Representative Kelly will yield. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Kelly, uh, there were a number of communities in Dakota County where uh, municipalities had some excess costs uh, that have in the past been reimbursed for these events. Is Dakota County eligible for reimbursement for those events uh, under this bill? Member from Goodhue, Representative Kelly. Uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative, yes, uh, Dakota County is listed as one of the counties. Uh, as we discussed, the, the dollars will be appropriated to the departments, and they will work through uh, the departments. Member from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, on behalf of those communities and any of the other communities affected, I would encourage uh, passage of this bill. Thank you. The member from Rams, Representative Knuth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I stand today in support of this bill, and I'm, I'm proud to support this bill because today is an example of what's best about state government. It's where we come together and step up and help people in need who've had one of the most traumatic things a, a, a community can experience with a major uh, natural disaster. And I think it's one of the most important jobs we do as a legislature, and I'm proud to be casting a yes vote for this bill. But members, I also think we need to take just a few minutes to think about the wider context of this bill and, and the wider work we do as legislators. Yes, we need to respond to disasters, but we also need to think about what's driving disasters in the weeks, months, and decades to come. And in this case, we need to think a little bit about climate change and the impact of climate change on, on the security and well-being of our fellow Minnesotans and ourselves. Climate change is happening, and while it doesn't cause any specific weather event, it stacks the dice, so to speak, in favor of more extreme weather events. So extreme rain events, floods, extreme droughts, like the 96% of Illinois that's in drought this summer, are more likely to happen under climate change. And as we know at the legislature, these kind of events are extremely costly in the well-being of individuals, families, and communities, and in the well and, and in the well-being of our state budget. I, I looked at the numbers, and just since I've taken office, um, the last six years, if you add up all the weather-related disasters, we've spent on average $88 million a year. And that's money I think is well spent and important to be spent, and I'm, I'm happy that the state can step up and help Minnesotans in that way. But it's also something we as legislators need to be thinking about in the long term. Representative Tooth, one minute, please. <laughs> Members, if you could, please. Take your conversations to the alcove, or better yet, the retiring room. Representative Knuth, you still have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker uh, and members. And I'm, I was glad to see in, in the paper in the Star Tribune a, a week or so after the Duluth floods an article about Duluth being proactive and wise enough to think about rebuilding their city in a way that reflects the reality of climate change and the impacts of more frequent, stronger rain events that the impacts that will happen on the community, especially with the kind of topography and geology as um, was talked about earlier on the floor. And members, Duluth is one city, the, city of, or the state of Minnesota is one state. I also think it's important to recognize um, that there are other organizations, organizations with a much larger reach that are um, uh, geographically a much larger reach that are dealing with the reality of climate change, planning for it, and wanting to take it on. And, and the two biggest um, 
kinds of groups that I think are taking on the challenge of climate change and planning for our, our security are the U.S. military. Um, and the U.S. military has done some of the best work on being prepared for climate change and, and the transition to clean energy. You can read about it in their quadrennial defense review. And a quote from Admiral Joe Nathman, he's a U.S. Navy uh, admiral, retired former commander of the U.S. Fleet Forces under President George W. Bush. And he, a, a quote from him, there are serious risks to doing nothing about climate change. We can pay now or we're going to pay a whole lot later. And that, members, we, we are happy to step up and help our, our fellow Minnesotans in need and Duluth and the surrounding communities, but we need to be smart about planning for a future where we have more of these kind of catastrophic weather events. Um, the other handout you'll see is a handout from Swiss Re. You know, may know Swiss Re as the second largest reinsurance company in the world. As you can imagine, insurance companies have a uh, major stake in understanding climate change and its impacts because of the uh, claims that they pay out. And so Swiss Re, is, it's, it's clearly a business opportunity for them, but it's also something uh, this company recognizes as a need to promote the security of families and community, individuals, families, and communities overall. Is, is one of the world's largest reinsurance companies just this week is trying to foster debate on climate change risks. So members, as we debate, or I don't think we need to necessarily debate, as we move forward on um, helping our, our uh, fellow Minnesotans up in the northeastern part of the state, I just ask you to take, a, take just a few minutes, maybe uh, do some searching on the, on the internet, talk to some fellow uh, legislators, call up a scientist, um, and ask them what, what they think about the impact of climate change and, and stacking the dice in favor of more catastrophic weather events like the kind that we're here on this floor to deal with today. And today in Minnesota, we're the kind of people who step up and help each other in need, and we put our state budget, our state dollars on the line, uh, on the table to make sure that Minnesotans have what they need to get through and recover and rebuild from a hugely uh, devastating natural disaster. But in the coming weeks and months and years, I hope Minnesotans are the kind of people who are wise enough to plan and to prepare for and to act in the face of climate change. So when these catastrophic weather events come again, we're, we're not having quite so many of them and we're better able to deal with them in the long term. Thank you. The member from Itasca, Representative Van Zells. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, members, I just want to take a little bit of your time to extend uh, my personal thanks and the thanks of the people from Cass, Itasca, Beltrami, Hubbard, Clearwater counties and the Leech Lake Indian Reservation for Article 2. Members, on July 2nd... Representative Van Zelks, one moment, please. Members, if you could, please. Take your conversations to the alcove, or better yet, the retiring room, so that the member who is recognized can be heard on the House floor. Representative Van Zelks, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, on July 2nd, those counties and the reservation experienced a devastating wind storm causing damage to homes. Much of our red and white pine forest, parks, campgrounds, and most importantly, private businesses and much of our resort community. Article 2 provides almost $8 million in relief for the stress and the strain on local law enforcement, for the stress and the strain on first responders, and for the stress and the strain on local units of government, including county boards and the tribal government. So I just want to extend as others have, my sincere appreciation and thanks to Governor Dayton and to leadership for crafting this piece of legislation in our time of need. And lastly, uh, there were no fatalities in this storm, 
which uh, is somewhat of a miracle. So uh, once again, thank you, and please vote for this uh, package of legislation. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 125 ayes and three nays, the bill is passed. The title is agreed to. Kirk report House File 2. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Dean moves that the rule therein be suspended and urgency be declared, that the rules of the House be so far suspended that the House File 2 be given its second and third readings and be placed upon its final passage. Call the member from Washington, Representative Dean, to, per, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This uh, as is the case with the first bill, will allow us to take up the bill. I appreciate your support. Have the support of the Democrats as well. The member from Hennepin, the minority leader, Representative Thiessen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the majority leader. Discussion to the motion. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the Dean motion signify by saying aye. aye. Pose nay. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill second reading. Second reading, House File 2. Discussion. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will give the bill third reading. Second reading. The clerk will give the bill third reading. Third reading, House File 2. Third reading. Call the member from Wabasha, Representative Kelly, to present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a corrections bill to the bill we just passed. We have some minor uh, corrections here. In section, section 1, uh, the change inserts language that is uh, used in other legislation. It says that the funds must be used by December 31st of 2013 or they would be uh, returned uh, to, the, uh, to the state, so, or to the general fund, excuse me. Then the other is in section 2. Uh, it's concerning wetland conservation procedures. It changes section, the word section, to article so that alternative processes and standards for wetland identification and replacement that we allowed in the flood relief bill can be applied to all projects, regardless of the funding. So uh, most projects uh, will require multiple funding sources to secure the maximum federal uh, match. If we don't change this, the alternative process and standards for wetland identification and replacement can only be done on projects funded solely with Bowser dollars. So again, we're leveraging uh, our federal dollars there. The last change would be Section 3. 
it simply fa uh, fixes an incorrect statutory reference. The statutory mechanism to provide the uh, MIF disaster loans is authorized in Section 12A um, and not 116J. So those are the technical corrections, Mr. Speaker, and uh, ask for uh, support of that. Further discussion to the bill? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 126 ayes and two nays, the bill is passed. The title is agreed to. Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. This is notify you that the Senate is now duly organized for the 2012 special session pursuant to the Minnesota Constitution and Minnesota statute. Signed, Kel R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Announcements. Mr. Speaker. Announcements. The member of Hennepin, Representative Smith. Announcements. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise to a point of personal privilege. State your point of personal privilege, Representative Smith. Mr. Speaker, it's the privilege of saying goodbye. I rise to look back with pride, to look around with dismay, and to look forward with hope. The first part of the pride I feel today is from a deep sense of personal accomplishment for work that has made a difference in the life of Minnesota. There are almost certainly 70 more women alive today because the House would not yield to the Senate when we raised the police awareness and made attempted strangulation a felony in 2005. Thousands of more non-custodial parents are now involved with their children because we updated the child support formulas in 2005. When Drew Shadeen was raped and left in a field to die, in, in a frozen field to die, by a liberated level three sex offender, we vowed that this should never happen again. So we passed a law providing for life without release for the worst of the worst predators convicted of premeditated murder or heinous sex crimes. We went from 400 meth labs in Chisago County in 2005 to only two a year later because we passed the toughest anti-meth law in the country in 2005. One person can make a difference with persistent pursuit for what is right as they are allowed to understand what is right. That, what, that's why I am proud to have been more, to have been chief author of more bills that were signed into law than any other member of this body. Sorry for the bragging. Actually, I'm not sorry. The second part of my pride today is to have worked with so many other individuals who were committed to make Minnesota better. There are certainly almost 500 more children alive today because I got to work with Mary Liz Holberg on the uh, Woman's Right to Know Act. There's 30,000 more law-abiding citizens in Minnesota to keep and bear arms. That's less infringed today because I got to work with Linda Boudreau and Larry Howes to deliver the Personal Protection Act from 1991 to 2007. Uh, I worked with and learned from my friend, Speaker Steve Swiggum, whose watchwords were balance and respect. Those watchwords enable to work to preserve personal freedom and get the necessary work done that individual citizens cannot do for themselves. Those watchwords of balance and respect were also learned and observed from another of my friends in the House, Speaker Margaret Anderson Keller, who showed that you can avoid deadlock and disgrace if you work with a governor from a different party. If you want Minnesota to succeed, you cannot hope that our governor will fail. The third of my pride 
today is because I got to be a voice for the old Republican Party that was legitimate and honorable strand of our American and Minnesota heritage. We were committed to doing well what had to be accomplished and doing without those things which people could do for themselves. That old-fashioned philosophy was reflected in the issues that I fought for. Public safety, bonds between parents and children, the right to bear arms, the right to protect life at both ends of our lives, and the right to private property. I have stood with Republicans like Teddy Roosevelt in defending the right of free men and women to negotiate for safer work conditions, reasonable benefits, fair pay in return for their labor. Anything that I have accomplished or made uh, has been made possible by people like Cheryl Burke, Mitzi Ellis, my LA's Jeff Diebel, Rebecca Pierius, Bill Marks, Gary Carger, and my friend of 41 years, Dennis Verdon. Finally, I'm proud to have worked respectfully, amiably, and productively with per people representing Minnesota's other great political faith. Much good has been accomplished by working with DFLers who can seek common ground and who can disagree without being disagreeable. I thank dozens of friends and colleagues, such as Deborah Hillstrom, Michael Paymar, Karen Clark, Sheldon Johnson, and my friend Tommy Rukavina. But I would be remiss if I did not thank and express admiration for that woman who combines passion, commitment, vision, and decency, Chair Mary Murphy from Hermantown. Also, my dear friend Andy Gilday, my dear friend Mary, who is behind me in the alcove today. I've known her for 24 years, and she's helped me with four re-elections. The last one didn't work, uh, but that's another story. <laughs> Finally, my dear son, Ryan, who will be 24 years old in six days. Now those of us who have had small children know that our long hours here have robbed us of some time with our kids. Further, he returned last year from four years of active duty with the U.S. Air Force as a military policeman, ground security, and while we were here debating bills, he served two tours in Iraq defending our right to do so. But as I look back in pride, I must also look around with sadness. The Republican Party, in which I believed, has at times shown inflexible adherence to the rhetoric of the principle of the day. I'm almost done. I will continue to look back with pride. I will continue to look around with sadness. And I will continue to live in hope. My hope is this, that the two-party system of civility and survival will be restored. Then Minnesotans will prevail. God will help free people who work together. In closing, I want to quote Ronald Reagan when he ran for president in 1980. He was criticized for having been an actor and therefore unfit to be president. He smiled at the question and he said politics and acting were similar. Say your lines, don't bump into the furniture, and then get off the stage. Thank you. Announcements. Further announcements. Seeing no further announcements, the member from Washington, the Majority Leader, Representative Dean. Motions and resolutions. Clerk, report the motions. Dean moves that the Chief Clerk be and is hereby instructed to inform the Senate and the Governor by message that the House of Representatives is about to adjourn this 2012 special session signing die. Member from Washington, Representative Dean, to the motion. 
Ms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, custom and courtesy to notify the Senate and the Governor that we have concluded our business. Appreciate your discussion to the Dean motion. See no further discussion. All those in favor of the Dean motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. Motion prevails. Dean moves that the Chief Clerk be and is hereby authorized to correct and approve the Journal of the House 2012 Special Session for today, Friday, August 24, 2012, and that he be authorized to include in the Journal for today any subsequent proceedings. The member from Washington, Representative Dean, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is our final bit of bookkeeping to complete the work that we have uh, completed today. Appreciate your support. Discussion of the Dean motion. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the Dean motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The motion prevails. The member from Washington, Majority Leader Representative Dean. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn the special session. Signe die. Representative Dean moves that the House do now adjourn the special session. Signe die. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The motion prevails, this, this, and this special session is adjourned. Signe die. <laughs> Member from Washington, Representative, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Dean completed the motion. We stand adjourned, members.